But let me share a thought. You know, just as not all schools are created equal and not all other things, not all formulas are created equal. Someone will tell me what this formula is. If any of you are finance people, so you should understand this. What's this formula here? We'll actually use it today in class. The good news is we're not going to use that one, but we'll use that third one. So what's this formula? What does it say? What's R should P stand for? So the return on the portfolio is equal to the sum from I to N, which is the number of assets, the weight times the return on the asset. Does that make sense? Okay. So that was easy to return. How about this one here? What's this one here? So it's the variance of a portfolio is equal to the sum of the weight of asset 1 squared times the standard deviation of variance plus the sum from I J, weight 1, weight 2, standard deviation 1, standard deviation 2, times the correlation. What does that tell us? The variance is what? It's a measure of what? Kind of risk volatility. Okay, but probably the most important formula of all finance is this one right here. I'm sure you guys have seen it in all your finance classes. Alec, you ever seen that formula before? You may have. <laughs> You probably have to because I made it up, but it's it's probably one of the most important formulas in life. You'll follow that formula, it will make a big difference on the things you accomplish. Brett, what do you think it is? What do you think the Y and G is? Based on what we talked about in this class. First thing that comes to mind, spend less than your earn. Less than your earn thoughts? Other thoughts? Any idea what Y and G is? That's right. If what you want is less than or equal to the what God wants, you will do well. Okay, a um, couple of things. Um, we have an, another opportunity for service tomorrow if anyone's interest, interested. Uh, we start our second Money Wise seminar on uh, next week. But we're also working with the church to put together some uh, lessons on personal finance. They've asked us if we could put the group, group together, uh, 10 to 12 people with a couple of couples there, and they're actually going to we're actually going to go through and do these uh, some of the presentations that they've set up. Uh, I'm looking for about another six people. Uh, there's some married couples that would like to come. Um, if you go, we'll be doing this next month as well. So if you go, it'll be kind of the same way with the money wise. If you go for two hours, it'll give you one hour of your service teaching. So. Right. So do we have to do any actual teachings, or can we do all of them through this? Um, normally what I've said before is you can do up to three money wise. I, I would, if you, um, I would say the fourth one I would allow you to do this, just because I'm looking for, for people to come and help out. We did it last, last week, and we're probably going to do it every week after this. Um, the School of Family Life is probably going to do two weeks, and then uh, the Merit School will do one week, but I'm looking for some volunteers. So tomorrow I'm responsible for getting students to come and help. So if you'd like to do that, uh, send me an email because I'm trying to put together the, the list, but I'd love to get one. It's 2 o'clock in the Joseph S. Smith building in uh, room 2060. Two so is that just tomorrow or is it recurring? It, it, it'll be recurring, but we, I don't think, well, I think we're going to do the School of Family Life because he has quite a few more students than I do. So you won't need anybody after tomorrow? And no, we'll probably need someone in like three weeks. So you can do that. And even if you wanted to come next week, you probably you could. It wouldn't be a wouldn't be a problem. Okay. Um, let's start with what we're doing today. <laughs> so. On the section on mutual fund basis, we're, we're almost to the end. So realize in uh, a week and a half, you'll have to hand in your investment plan. And that investment plan is going to include your investment policy statement, plus two learning tools, plus a snapshot page from each of your assets that you choose here. So six, you want to develop criteria that you can use to select a good mutual fund, mutual index or ETF for your portfolio. So your assignment was the, the reading and your assignment was to think through what makes a good mutual fund. Using that criteria in Learning Tool 7, you'll pick one mutual fund minimum for each of your asset classes. You can do more, but, but you want to uh, do one minimum. So this is not for right now, but once you get out of school, you've got a real job. 
you know, some people are going on to the medical school and things like that, or uh, law school. But I, you, I recommend that you have a minimum of four asset classes just for diversification. On selecting assets, you're going to use that criteria that you developed earlier. Use Morningstar or other programs. I actually would like you to use Morningstar because it's quite good. Nice thing is we have a, a we have a, a version in in the library. It's normally about uh, I think about hundred and ten dollars a year. We actually get them free for the students, so we might as well use it while you while you can. And I'd like you to print off the snapshot page from Morningstar. That tells me okay, what are your fees and what are your expenses? What's your turnover? Things that, that are important. I'd like you to choose the uh, chosen fund names in your Exhibit 2, Learning Tool 13, with your target allocations. You'll actually assemble your completed, completed plan. And what this does is once you graduate and you get that first paycheck, you know where your 20%, you know where that money's going. Okay. Um, so let's do, uh, let's do a little bit of friendly competition. Now, are all earnings created alike? What's the best type of earnings? Let's, let's, get, let's get you five here will be one group. You want to pass that back? You guys, the back are going to be about five or there. We're going to have you guys be a group here. These two, two rows will be a group. And pass it here. So what we're doing here, is the, the important is to understand that not, not all earnings is created the same. So I, I will bring it up. I'll bring up the screen so everyone can see it. So we're going to have a little friendly competition. So here's what it is. So you see, okay, stocks. What's the federal tax rate? And what's the state tax rate? Now I realize some states do not have a state tax rate, but Utah does. So what we'd like you to do is you can actually tell us, is it an ordinary rate, which is your marginal tax rate, or is it at a preferred tax rate? And what is that preferred rate? Okay, the, the best time last, this morning's class, was 95 seconds. So what we're going to do is we're, we're going to we're going to have a timer here. Of course, I say 95 seconds and no one got all of them right, but it was still still a fun. So do we understand the do we understand the problem? So as soon as you get as soon as you get your your answer, as soon as you've got all the answers, you raise your hand. Okay, hopefully you've got some accounting students there who can kind of help you out. Okay, on your mark, get set, go. If you get all the answers, raise your hand and see the, okay, the competition, you know, you're in about 35 seconds less than you've got the undergrads. Yeah, you guys are getting close. Anyone close? Team close? Done. Okay. 
Yeah. 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 So, Kara, let's have you take us through it. Since you guys came up first, let's see if they got it right. So, first of all, short-term capital gains. Short-term capital gains on the federal side, or, or both state and tax? Or yeah. State and federal. Uh, short-term capital gains are ordinary. Is okay. the state of Utah 5%? Is the state of Utah 5%? I always thought the state of Utah, everything was just gone. Whatever your marginal tax rate is. Don't think that they care about yeah, it. I guess it's 5%. Well, it's like the marginal rate is always 5%. Yeah. Yeah. It's always 5%. Okay. How about long-term capital gains? Uh, long-term capital gains are preferential rates, so for, uh, for the majority of us, it's 20%. Well, it's your price. Well, it's your price. It's your price. It's your price. Yes, that's what I'm trying to say. So if, if your marginal tax rate is 15% or above, it's what? Zero. Zero. If, if, it's, if it's market tax rate is below 15%, it's zero. zero. It's tax rate, long term capital gains are zero. Yeah. And it, if it's above, market tax rate is 15% or above? 15 yeah, 15 or 20%. 20% if you're. Uh, 30, 30, 30, 30. Yeah, okay. that's right. How about um, dividends? Qu a qualified stock it's dividend? Qualified, uh, qualified is taxed at your. Uh, Preferential. Preferential rate. So it's the same as long-term capital gains. Yeah, How about that. ordinary dividends? And what's the difference there? Yeah. Okay, so let's let's just show a little qualified dividend. This is learning tool 34. You purchased the stock on June 28th of 2012. It went X dividend on July 6th. And you sold it on 8-1. Was that qualified or not? So here's the definition. So here's the definition of a qualified dividend. So a qualified dividend are dividends paid by a U.S. corporation. You held the stock for more than 60 days during the 121-day period. Begins 60 days before the ex dividend. Is that weird? How they came up with that, I really have no clue. And so what we do is we can look here on this. We bought it on June 28th with X on July 6th. We sold it on August 1st. It wouldn't have, it wouldn't have been qualified. How about if we had sold it on December 1st? All of a sudden, it would have been qualified. So the point here is, is if we're buying and selling individual securities, we need to understand about the dividends. Hopefully, you guys are doing mutual funds, and so it's not important. So, how about bonds and savings vehicle? I put these up here so you can actually see that. Short-term capital gains, again, marginal. Long-term capital gains, again, 15% zero, or uh, that's 3.8% depending on you know, what your tax, uh, your market tax rate is. How about coupon payments? Okay, again, marginal tax rate. Muni bonds? Not from your state. What's your federal tax rate? Zero. Yes, zero. How, how about how about muni bonds? If they're from your state, what are your what's your tax tax rate? Yeah, if the, if the muni bonds are from your state, often the tax rate on the muni bonds are zero as well. So that's why you have a muni bond fund for Colorado or a muni bond fund for New York or things like that. Um, muni bond. How about capital gains? You got a muni bond? Are there any preferential taxes for capital gains? Long term. Yes, it's just it's the same long term. That uh, the muni bonds are only for interest only, tax free for interest only. How about mutual funds? Are, is a mutual fund any different than the asset class that it holds? So, example, if it's stocks, are the taxes exactly the same? The answer is yes. Because they're they're pass through vehicles. Questions on this? So you now know what a qualified dividend, you, you know what the taxes are. So you can see the impact of taxes on our 
portfolio. Let's do a little case study. Here's a case. This, this is actual numbers from 2000, uh, 2012, but I, I didn't have enough data. But that's all right. Let's calculate. So do you know how to calculate the returns on a mutual fund? Do you remember how to do that? I'm sure you read it. So the return on, the return on a stock is equal to ending NAV. your ending NAV minus your beginning NAV, which is just your appreciation there in the, in the fund, plus any distributions. Now notice we've got, we've got three different, really three different types of distributions. What are short-term distributions? What would they be considered? Interest, interest, ordinary dividends, things like this. Long-term capital gains? Again, anything that, that meets our category, they've owned it longer than 366 days. Qualified dividends, those are stocks where you held the shares more than 60 days in the 121 day period, beginning 60 days. Okay, so that's, that's the return before tax. What would be the return after tax? Why? This is this is not, not any different. Why is that? Are we working with realized or unrealized? This is actually unrealized here. But then with the dividends, it's going to be so we're going to be your short-term capital gains or your ordinary dividends times one minus your tax rate, and then plus cap gains again times one, one minus your tax rate. And what would your tax rate equal? Tax rate equals your federal plus your state. And again, the same thing there is just divided by an ADP. So what we're trying to do is just try to say, hey, what is our what are our gains? What is our return before tax? What's our return after tax? How do we calculate? Again, here we said the return on the portfolio is equal to the weights of the portfolio times the return on the assets. Again. So what I'm doing is I'm giving you the weights of the portfolio. And in our case, so we're giving you the weights of the portfolio, each of the individual assets in the portfolio. So all we have to do is calculate the returns before tax and after tax, and then we can get the return on the portfolio. Okay. So here's what I'd like to do. Let's divide into five groups. Each of the groups, we, we, I handed out five of those tax sheets. So a group one here, you guys are going to do Fidelity Magellan. Group in the back, you guys are going to do the, the small cap. You in the front here, you're going to do Vanguard Short-Term Bond Fund. In the back, you're going to do the Muni Bond Fund. And then the, this front group here, you're going to do the Short-Term Treasury. Quick question. <coughs> Fidelity Magellan, is it, is it all taxable or do they have any tax advantages on these assets? What do you think? All taxable or there's any tax advantages? All taxable. All taxable. Small cap? Taxable. Short term bond fund? How about muni bond? Interest is tax free for what? For federal. So federal tax free, treasury bond funds, state tax free. And again, if the muni bond fund is from your state, it may be state tax free. Okay, 
Let's give you guys a couple of minutes. I'd like you to calculate the before tax return. You saw the formula there. In fact, I'll lift this up. There's your before tax return and your return after tax. Okay? Yeah, you should be able to see that. Okay, let's take a couple of minutes. Would this be something that would be good on a quiz? Yes. Would you like a learning tool, tool to help you out with this? Yes. So it's quite now. So most states don't make a distinction between long term capital gains and short term Or 
So here's here's just some notes. Here's our formula again. Our ending NAD minus our beginning NAD. This is, gives our unrealized, and the distributions are our realized, realized uh, returns here. And again, that that gives us our that gives us our after tax return. So here's, here's learning tool 33. So what you do is you'll put in your capital gains tax rate at the top, your marginal tax rate here. And again, notice what we have. Here's our ending NAV, our beginning NAV, short-term distributions. This is at your marginal. <coughs> Long-term capital gains and qualified. These are, at your, um, these are at your preferential rates. And the percent of the portfolio, we put that in. So 11.5, 11.7, that's the same thing there. 2.75, 4.53. Notice, let, let's go back to this one here. You've already got negative returns, and what do taxes make that? Even worse. More negative. So, this is kind of an interesting thing here. Schwab, you can see there's kind of, here's uh, after tax, or before tax and after tax, you know, kind of significant. Again, short term bond funds. So notice here, this is one plus, or this is your tax rates. So this is federal plus state. How is this one different? It's only 22. Why is, why is it different than the 32 percent there? Preferential. Preferential tax rate here. So the nice thing here is now what we can do is we can calculate portfolio before tax, portfolio after tax. So could you use this? Could you do this for a quiz? Questions? Do you understand now how to calculate before tax and after tax returns? Okay. Here's a question. Um, why don't we pick individuals? Go ahead. Uh, I just yeah. had a question uh, going back to the problem with the board. Okay. Um, so for the very last one, the one that I account, I wasn't sure why it's 22% as the rate instead of 15%. Okay, because uh, it's 15% for federal, but it's still 7% for state. Okay, is it not, was it not state free? Let's see. State free. Is 
estate tax? No, um, right, it was state tax free, so it's, it's only state tax free for the short term distributions, not for the long term capital. Okay. okay. So that's why there. Okay. Okay. So why, why don't we pick stocks as soon as you get out of school? Why do we tell you to wait until you've got roughly a half a million dollar portfolio before you start buying individual stocks? <laughs> what do you think? Why? Well, you might be very well diversified if you can get individual stocks. That's a lot of idiosyncratic things to take. So, so you're not you're not diversified for for individual stocks. Other reasons. So, lack of diversification. Other reasons. It's a red book. Here. I wouldn't say it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of time. My, my guess for most of you is your goal is going to be spend more time in your day jobs and with your families. I find I like a passive invest, investing approach so I can do really important things like play foosball with my daughter who kills me every time she plays. I can always beat her. But, but doing stuff like that. Other reasons. It's really hard to beat the market. It's hard to beat the market. And you know, most people, well, let me, let me share a, a, a teacher evaluation that I got at the end of uh, a class a couple of years ago. And they were very polite. It says here, the investment plan of this class, not the teacher, so he was very thoughtful, me, breeds mediocrity. As the finance elective, the class is dumbed down, built in with quirk and dirt, quick and dirty rules for how to invest and what is best. We don't learn how to think for ourselves, value, risk, and reward, or ask deeper questions. This would be a great class for non-finance students. They could easily invest in some market tracking indexes and watch their monthly contributions add up to a million dollars over their lifetime. But is that what we are teaching our finance students? Sure, it's a safe bet, but it all seems too mediocre to me. Teach me how to beat the market, find trends, and discover new methods. Give me something that I couldn't find from another college's personal finance policy. How would you respond? If you do your way, I'll do mine. Let's see what that is. <laughs> yeah, let's not continue. Let me share my response. Four thoughts from the evaluation. The class is dumbed down with quick and dirty rules for how to invest. Is it really dumbed down, or do, do we try to understand principles, develop a plan, build a sleep well portfolio, and understand our behavior? Is it just math or personal behavior? Are the things taught quick and dirty rules to invest, or is there experience, logic, and theory behind the principles and plan stuff? Realize, I didn't just come out of PhD and come back to college. You know, I, I worked for a number of years managing real money and real assets. Two, teach me how to beat the market. Teach me to find trends and discover new methods. You know, can we realistically do this in five class periods? Someone has very high expectations. <laughs> if it was easy to beat the market, every person with class periods of investments would we do it. Look around you and read. Most investors haven't. If you really want to learn active management skills, which is not the purpose of this class, there are other classes, but it takes years to learn the skills well. Do most financial professionals beat the market? From my understanding, most do not consistently beat the market, and they are paid very well. If most professionals do not beat the market, what do you about, think about professors teaching this? Managed for 13 years, and it is very difficult. What percent of mutual funds do you think actually beat the market in 2000 and 14. You think it was a lot? 30, 25. I think I, I think it's in the slides. What do you think? You think it's forty percent? You think it's lower? This is FEMA. This is percent of actively managed funds which underperform their benchmarks. So between 65, 60 and 65 percent of these mutual funds underperform their benchmarks. And these are guys getting paid millions and millions of dollars. And so if the professionals are having problems beating the benchmark, what makes you think a student with five week, five class periods? Three, give me something I can't find in another school's personal finance class. 
doesn't matter where education knowledge comes from. Isn't education the process of learning the best things regardless of the source of the knowledge? And four, we don't learn how to think for ourselves, value, risk, and reward, or ask deeper questions. So this is the best part of the whole valuation. Three final thoughts. I hope you realize that I'm teaching things which I hope will save you a million dollars over your lifetime. However, because this is only one semester, I can't go into depth in the many areas. My goal is to pique your interest and let you continue your education. You graduate, but your education is only beginning. Two, I do hope you will continue to think for yourselves, to value risk and reward, and to ask the deeper questions. But I also want you to realize that while theory is good, theory changes. Keep your testimony and priorities in the most important areas. And three, while there are differences of opinion as to the teaching of investments, I've tried to make this an applications class and teach the application of correct principles. That is what will help you accomplish your personal and family goals. So, don't try to beat the market. Just, just for fun, I was at, some of you know I was in Steve Thorley's um, finance class yesterday with uh, David Wrigley. So we asked Steve Thorley before, what percent of your portfolio assets are, are passively managed? What did he say it was like? 90% or 95%, something like that. <coughs> so, and in mine, I'm probably about, probably about the same thing. So there is a place for both active and passive management, but it just depends. And I like, there's an article in the Wall Street Journal going in on the active versus, active versus passive. The answer is sometimes both. I actually think you can find, put both in your portfolio, but only after you've hit a million dollars or a half a million dollars. Other, other thoughts, why we should be buying individual stocks early on? I think just sort of going along with that active versus passive, if someone knew how to beat the market, they wouldn't tell anybody. Yeah. Because they would just go beat the market. And make the money and, and make the money yourself. themselves. If they tell everybody else, then now everybody else knows. So why do you not why do you think there's so many people selling things? If you have a method that doesn't work. You sell it, you don't do it. You sell it. <laughs> I told you about my cousin. Yeah. Found this way, wrote this computer program. He came to me and he says, you know, hey, I wrote this program and, and people are paying, I can't remember what, three or four hundred dollars for it. Sold like 50 copies of it. So the only problem is I can't get it to work. Can you help me? I told him I don't have any better ideas than you. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. So, so we talked about diversification. We talked about high costs. We talked about hard to beat the market. Let me just go over a few of these here. Again, stay diversified. It's hard when you just have a single company. Nice thing you buy an index fund, like the S&P 500 index fund, you've got 504 stocks. You go to Russell 2000, you've got 2,000 plus stocks. I really like what are called total market indices. You can, buy, you can actually buy an index that has all listing stocks, you know, international stocks. It's got like about 8,000 stocks. Two, low cost and tax efficiency. Investing low cost. When you've just got a small portfolio, you know what? I heard someone today, they bought, they bought $200 worth of a stock and it cost them $10 to make the trade. Yeah. Think about that. That's 5%. Stuart? The total market index, um, how much do they keep of each stock? A very tiny percent. So, but does it favor, like, by market cap? Like, if it's the bigger no. market cap? They, can, they can't use, percent. they're not going to buy all 10,000 stocks, but they'll use some. Uh, so frameworks such as stratified sampling and other methods to get as close to it as they can. Just curious. Know what you invest in. Anyone here from the uh, Silver Fund? You know, I, I just asked, asked my students, I had a couple of students from my asset management class, and I said, what's the average amount of time per company that you analyze it before making a decision? And they said roughly 10 to 15 hours. That's per company. That's just one company. And so realize, you know, those are people who kind of know what they invest in. At least that's what we teach them. We teach them in the asset management class. And interestingly, we, we've been unique in the last yeah, nine years. We've outperformed at six of nine years. And we beat the benchmark on average by about 100 basis points a year for those nine years. So we're unique. But it's probably because the Lord's blessing us because, you know, we're trying to teach people how to do that. Um, don't spend too much time trying to beat the market. And there's so much more to an evaluation. I mean, this is just a, a tiny bit. And the last one, stock selection, is just not required to have a successful investment portfolio. You can have a successful portfolio and never buy a single stock or never buy a single bond. 
And for most of you, that's probably what I, that, that's what I would recommend. So it's just, so what should we be doing? So my advice is write a good investment plan, an investment policy statement, just like we do in this class. Maintain a general, we're, we're passive strategy for stock selection and active strategy for asset allocation. What does that mean? Are you balancing your portfolio on an annual or even semi-annual basis? Okay, part of that. So what is passive for stock selection? So if we want to do large cap, what do we buy? An index fund following large cap. If we want to do small cap, what do you buy? An index fund following small cap. What do we mean here an active strategy for asset allocation? You can decide you like large, you know, you want to take a little bit less risk so you have a, a higher allocation to large cap stocks. Or you want to take a little bit more risk, you can throw in a little bit of emerging markets or international. So we're active at the stock selection side and we're passive at the stock selection. We're not buying individual stocks, we're just buying whole asset classes. Enjoying your family and friends, doing well in your day job, making a difference in your families, your church, and the communities. So, you know, I'm just, I, I want to encourage you guys to think through the issues. Hopefully we're giving you information for them. And you know, one of the principles here was invest low cost. How important is it, is it for you to invest low cost? So instead of buying a high management fee, actively managed fund, it's just to buy low cost. This is from John C. Bogle. He actually runs, uh, CEO of, of Vanguard. But this is in the Financial Analyst Journal, and this is just the summary. It says, this article represents a rare, if not unique, attempt to estimate the drag on mutual fund returns engendered by all in investment experience expenses, including not only expense ratios, until now the conventional measure of fund costs, but also fund transaction costs, sales load. So transaction costs, sales load, and cash drag. We'll talk about that. Compared with costly actively managed funds over time, low-cost index funds create extra wealth of 65% for retirement plan investors. Would you like to have 65% more? Yeah. So the point here is, is these simple, quick and dirty rules that, we, that we've given you here are ways to help you laugh all the way to bank, to bank your retirement. Okay. So... Let's kind of step back from the individual stocks now and let's talk about what makes a good mutual fund. If you don't know what makes a good mutual fund, how will you know when you find it? So let's just share a few things. Thoughts? Brendan? Low turnover. Low turnover. Turnover is a proxy for what? Taxes. taxes. And so if you have low turnover, you should have low taxes, which should allow you to keep more. Of your return. That's what I was going to say, but just um, the expense ratio or the cost to. Okay, keep your cost down and invest low cost. How do you do that? No load funds and watching your expense ratios. Again, from that article there, if you choose no load or if you choose low cost funds, you'll have significantly more retirement. Other. Yes. Well, if it's like an index or a passively managed fund, then. And this isn't something we really talk about, but I feel like if it's larger, their expenses are likely to be lower uh, relative to the amount of assets they're managing. And so, so just like, yeah, if everybody's doing it, it can't be that bad. So economies of scale. Okay. So now what I'm going to do, other things? So what do we talk about in the book? So you guys read it. You guys, have, you guys have said that you read it. You said you've looked at that. What were some of the things? So we talked about... Diversification, talked about cash drag. What's cash drag? Lower rate, lower rate of cash. <laughs> right. So you're, you're, you're investing in a fund that's large cap. Which will have the higher returns, large cap or cash? Large cap. So the more cash you have, <coughs> it's going to drag your performance. Here, you were talking about Okay, so those things. Uh, diversification, cash. Well, let's, let's just take some of your... Funds. Let's start with our group there. Cassie, your group. What was what was your asset class and what was your choice of funds? So um, ours was um, our emergency fund. Okay. And we looked at um, 
municipal bond. Okay. So what, what was your what's the ticker? <laughs> H W K A X. H W K A. L W. H W K A X. Yeah. Okay, Sun America 2020 high water mark. Oh wait, this one is. It's dot L W. This one has a high low. Okay, so let's just look at here. Purchase. Let's go look at the bottom here. Look at five and seven, five and three quarters percent front and low. So notice here. Review other classes. What, that the A has a five and five and three quarter percent load. You know how many years it's going to, how great fun you're going to have to have to get rid of this. And this is a bond fund. It's going to take you 50 years. Note this one's got a front end load. Look at that expense ratio, 136 basis points. What can you get these with a Vanguard fund or an index fund? Probably not. Now notice even this one here. 89 basis points, of course, you have to have at least $5 million, so that's institution. So, so A W K A X. You just put dot LW. I think this one's a little better. Dot LW. And the question is, let's look, let's look at those fees. Minimum investment status, oh, it's limited. So my guess here is this one is the load wave. You have to have five million to get into it. But let's look at it anyway. You guys have another one? Someone else have another one? Uh, I do. I don't know if it's a header, but okay. if you want to try it. It's D W F I X. D W F I X? Yeah. Okay, so this is and this is not just domestic, this is a world, this is uh, this is international bonds. So, minimum investment, it's open. Turnover, 41%. Notice this one, the expenses of 0.2, 20 basis points. So, let's start, let's just kind of take a look at it. So, one of the things, so we, let's, we talked about uh, diversification. Look at, look at the portfolio. So, we're going to look at holdings. So, you've got 10 other holdings. So, what this is, Top 25 holdings. Is this a fund of funds? Oh, so what they do is, so it's got 73 holdings. So this has got both long and short. What does it mean they've got short? They can sell things short. Grease bonds. Pardon me? <laughs> they got some grease bonds that they So they, they've sold short on some of those. Um, well, let's go. So let's let's start. Let's just look at the the costs. Any expenses here? So twenty basis points, no front end. Purchase constraint. Oh, this is a T here. Notice that T says institutional. So individual investors can't buy this one. Someone have another one? We got to make sure things we can buy. And you wouldn't have known that unless we talked about it in class. So that's the purpose of us being here. Nathan? Um, Q, Q, Q. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let's move on to the, let's move on to the next one. But, but you need to look at those. You need to make sure it's not an institutional fund. Make sure it's not front end load. Also, if it's a load wave, generally it's for institutional clients who have, have fairly large uh, amounts to invest. Alec, what, what's, give us a fund that you guys had. I don't know. Jordan. Uh, Russell, you know? Uh, no, no, you want to give me a fund. Give me the ticker. Oh, um. Uh, Eric, can you help him out? Um, we're at a different uh -oh. cap. I mean, the yeah, needed small cap. And the uh, one of mine was uh, N A E S X. Okay, and the ESX, Vanguard small cap. Look at this, minimum investments 5,000, status is open. Turnover 10%, is that good for a small cap fund? Exactly quite good. So let's start at the top. 
Portfolio will do holdings. How many stocks does it hold? So it's got 1,511 stocks. Is that pretty diversified? Look at here, the assets in the top 10 holdings, 2.72%. So what normally I'll do is I'll take that amount, divide it by 10. So the, the, the largest assets are 0.27% of this. How much research do you have to do when your largest assets are 0.27% of the portfolio? So that's the thing about the diversified funds. There's not a lot of work you have to do. So very diversified, annual turnover 10%. That should lead to lower taxes. So let's look. We're going to look here at tax expense. <clears throat> so this is a no-brainer. It's just a tax. <clears throat> we understand percent ranking category over the last 15 years on a tax <clears throat> tax adjusted. It's in the top 39%. <clears throat> <laughs> Notice in 10 years, it's the top 6%, 5 years it's the top 15, 3 years it's the top 15, 1 year it's the top 35%. This is a no-brainer index fund, and it's in the top third over all these time periods. So does watching turnover help and low expenses? Let's look at our fees here on this. So I'm going to look at purchase fees. Again, nine basis point minimum purchase. So if you've got an admiral share, it's nine basis. If it's this one, it's eight basis, but you have to have five million. So on this one, you have to have a minimum of, this one you have to have a minimum of 10, it's actually closed to all new investments. Now what is this AIP? They sell AIP. Isn't that like action qualified access, not close to all new investments? The A. A like it says institutional. Oh, excuse me, qualified uh, access. You're right. Yeah. But the, uh, Vanguard actually it does have another one that, that individual investors can buy. It's still pretty cheap. It's not as cheap as this one. But so let's let's do another thing. Let's look and see if there's any. One of the other things we talked about is we talked about style drift. What is style drift? Anyone heard that? So what we do here is we take a look at this here. So here's value, blend, and growth. And then we have large cap, mid cap, and small cap. Know that right there, it's small growth. So style drift is just what happens over time. Notice all those five boxes are the same. This is over the last five years that it's investing the same level. You know, you would buy this fund if you want a, an index fund that, that uh, the benchmark is the Russell 2000, which is also a small, small blend. So is there much style diff here? The answer is no. How much, how much cash is in the portfolio? Because that's important. Cash, 0.59%. Is that pretty good? Yeah. How big is this fund? $51 billion. It's a fairly large fund. Garrett. On the uh, purchase tab, uh -huh. um, what, what was stopping just from like a regular investor going and purchasing the three thousand amount? On that bottom one, didn't look like there was a purchase. Oh, amount. it was there one. I, maybe I saw it wrong. But you that bar, very bottom one, yeah. Oh, purchase? you're right. That's it. So instead of paying nine basis points, you're paying twenty three basis points, and that's, your mi minimum initial purchase, purchase is three thousand. Yeah. And then what you can do once you have that three thousand, you can actually bring it in. Uh, you know, $100 a month or 200 a month. Yeah, it's still, still, it's still even at 0.23, the top 10% of the yeah. small cap. So this is, I actually own this fund. So it's been a good, it's been a good fund. Okay, let's, let's do the group in the middle. Okay, Darren, what did you guys come up with? Uh, what, what, was your, what was your asset class? Uh, SARS was emerging markets. Okay. What did you come up with? What we looked up was VEIEX. Which is actually an ETF, I believe. V E I E X. V E I E X. Okay? Emerging markets. Let's look at a couple of things. First of all, let's do purchase. What are, what are the expenses? Again, 3,000. You can notice Vanguard has Admiral shares, Insta Plus shares for institutional. 
And if you've got a, um, if you've got five million dollars, you can use this one here, which is only has twelve basis points of cost. So the top three are institutional. Okay, let's see how, how portfolio, how many stocks in this one, how diversified is it? We'll go to holdings. A thousand holdings. Top ten holdings equals seventeen percent. So your largest holdings is roughly one point seven percent, two percent. How much work do you have to do on the individual holdings here? Probably very little. Let's go back to style drift and cash. <clears throat> How much cash do these guys have? You can actually ninety-eight point five two, so roughly one and a half percent cash. Has there been any style drift? No. Let's come and look at performance. So there's an interesting thing here. Um, Morningstar still hasn't figured out all the benchmarks for the different classes here. So what we're going to do here is we're going to look at, here's the benchmark, here's the category. So here's the fund, here's the category, and here's what they've done plus versus the category. So year to date, they're off 80 basis points from the category. So the category is off 8.63%. And they're off 15. So, and then the important thing here is let's look at the rank in the category. 56, 18, 79, 52. That rank doesn't look really too good there. Uh, any thoughts why? The emerging market's pretty volatile. Let's look on a tax-adjusted basis. That, all, that all often gives us some better insights. 37, 36, 50, 58, 43, 56. This one's not quite, my guess is they use a different benchmark than what they're compared against. But it's still kind of an interesting one. So, it's called. <laughs> Okay, so, so you know you need to look into those. That's what I'm going to do. Okay. Okay, other, how about the group here? Which one was your asset class? We had REITs. REITs, and what was your choice? We did FRXIX. FRXIX. X. Fidelity Spartan. Minimum investment 25, open, turnover 12%. Really good. Fee level low, expenses 0.23%. Total assets half a million, uh, half a billion. No load. Yield at 2.37%, which is quite good. So, so are we getting a sense on what we need to do? So what we do is we would just start, let's just... You know, so what makes a good mutual fund? We could actually just go to the start. And we could say, good diversification. How many stocks does this hold? We'll come into portfolio and holdings. 93 holdings. Oh, percent of assets in the top 10 holdings, about 40, 44%. You know, you still have 93 holdings, but that means your average your top 10 are about 4% again. Um, still not bad. So diversification, so you've got 93 assets. So low cost, let's look at our fees here, purchase. We can actually see, we're, so we're doing this index investor, 23 basis points, is that su sufficiently low cost? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's look at tax efficiency, or tax, Look at this, three, one year, looks like it's been about the top 15 or top 20% every year. Pretty good for a, an index fund, so that looks good here. Turnover, we can actually just go back to the quote, and they said the turnover was about 12%, that's probably why the taxes look so good. Uninvested cash, 0.9%, it's probably a little bit on the high side, but that's still not bad there. Style drift. We saw there on portfolio. Again, have we had any style drift there? No. And then smaller positive tracking error. 
We can actually go to performance. And there's really two ways. Each of these funds, we can compare it against the benchmark, or we can compare it against the category. And the category is all other funds in this asset class. And there, SR is real estate. So here, ranking category 49, 60, 12, and 25. So 2013, it was kind of a tough year, but they seem to be doing better. So are you concerned that this, is, this has only been around a little while? Could a little bit, but is Fidelity a good name? Do they have a reputation for putting good funds out? Yeah. So I think this is, this is one, uh, this is one, a good one. Like some of the other ones, you know, their other ones are good too. Let's do our last one here. So international. Uh huh. Um, O G L Y X. Oppenheimer. First of all, is Oppenheimer a good name? Yeah. So let's look. Turnover of eleven percent. No minimum investments. Fee level below average. Expenses are 089 percent. But would you expect with international? It would be a little bit more expensive? Yeah. Probably. So we'll start diversification. We'll look at our portfolio holdings. As you can see, what, what we've got now is we've, we've established criteria to help us to know. 90 holdings, assets in the top 10 are 21, so the average is 2%. Even though they have fewer holdings, they're still not very, they're still not, you know, they're not overweight anymore. So we've got that. Let's go back here and we can actually look at our, see if there's been any style drift. Notice we are growth, large cap growth. Okay, low cost, we'll get our purchase. Again here, realize the ones you want to buy. So these are all institutional. Look, but this one's got a five and three quarter percent front end growth. I wouldn't do that one. A five percent deferred growth, I wouldn't do that one. That one. Look at those expense ratios there. So, what are they doing by putting loads on funds and putting high expense ratios? <laughs> are they are they pushing people toward index funds? And the answer is yes. And that's why index funds came about, because most of the small investors couldn't get decent returns. And so, um, so it's just, it's just kind of interesting. I, I probably wouldn't do this one just because of the fees there. Stuart. So this might be a dumb question, but... Why, what, from here on out, why don't you just ask the question and not worry about whether it's dumb or not. My questions are usually dumb anyway. Okay. You guys don't comment, so I, I so, won't. <laughs> so let's say you research and you find like a Vanguard fund and uh -huh. a Fidelity fund that you okay. want to buy and you're trying to make it as inexpensive as possible. To do that, you go directly to the company, right? So right. you have to go to Vanguard, buy that fund, and yes. then go to Fidelity and buy that fund. Now you can go to a broker and they'll charge you like 10 or 15 bucks to buy the Vanguard fund that you could buy for free, or the Fidelity fund you could buy for free. But there's no point in it. There's that. no point. Okay. And in my Quicken, I can just set it up where it goes out you know, in 20 seconds it goes out to Vanguard, brings all the information in. Another 20 seconds it goes out to Charles Schwab or Fidelity or any of these other ones here. And so it really doesn't matter that it's it's in different places. I can still, quick and still brings it in, gives me my asset allocation, helps me to see where I am and where I should be. Let me just share one more. Mainly because this is what I used in the... In the, uh, in the PowerPoints. This is the Vanguard, S&P 500 index fund. Let's just do some of these things, same things here. Purchase price. Notice the first one is for inst A, for institutional. The admiral is for institutional amounts, and the investor is for basically any of us. 3,000 million, 3,000 3, minimum investment, and 17 basis points. Again, let's look at our portfolio. How many holdings? If it's the S&P 500, how many holdings do you think it'll be? Yeah, 504 holdings. Turnover, 3%. What do you think about that? So let's look at our taxes. Just fun. How is This is just a vanilla index fund on the S&P. Notice, 15-year, 35 basis points. 
The rest is in the top, top 30, top 20, top 15. So the key is we can choose this. Now, so we've, we've given you questions. Right? We gave you a What I've done here is I've said, okay, let's see what my, what my color coding was. So the principle, what I ask you in this problem here is highlight. I've given you this stock report and highlight the different things. Diversification is in your orange. So what we'll do is we'll page down. Oh, well. Okay, here's your style drift up here, you know, we talked about that. Up here, the yellow is your fees. <coughs> we talked about tracking error versus your benchmark. This is your percent range and category, which is, we talked about tracking error, which is the difference between your FUD minus the benchmark. Is it okay if you, is it okay if you have positive tracking error? What is that we don't want? Negative tracking error. So I don't mind a little bit, you know, if my fees are 20 basis points, I don't mind but I'm under, underperforming by 20 basis points. Our turnover ratio, we talked about that. That's the impact of taxes. Notice we've got more performance here. This is the category. These are the numbers there. We talked about, again, more performance there. Um, here, again, our fees, 15 basis points, no load. Actual fees, 11 basis points. Here is what, what percent of cash. They've got 0.5%, and here's our style. So, We've got the reports. What ideally, if, if your company has one of these reports, print these off instead of a snapshot page. Print off, print off the report. They don't, don't do these reports for everybody, but they do for a lot. Okay, we've talked about a lot of stuff today. Again, putting it in perspective: principles, uh, your investment plan, portfolio, and selecting assets. So, what are our takeaways from today's? See what low turnover means. When we actually get into reports, you can start seeing some of the numbers. Well, like when they looked at who could invest in it, uh -huh. I wasn't sure. I didn't even think about that. Okay. Like, you know, all these institutions now that I looked at. But don't, don't feel sad because of these case studies. Actually, the case studies here using Morningstar, Morning's card doesn't differentiate it out very well. And so, you know, I, I did a, a large cap one and Nine of the 13 stocks individuals couldn't buy, so you're unique, but at least you're seeing those now. Other takeaways? Yeah, I've just been following along on the Charles Schwab site. Uh, and I just started, I don't have any money in it, but it's basically free. It's a lot of the same stuff up here, and it's just kind of really cool to see all the different things to look at. So. See all the different things to look at. Yes. Ken, I haven't picked on you in a while. What are your takeaways from today? I mean, there's just lots of numbers to look at, but if you can identify the most important ones, that yeah. give you a good indicator. So lots of numbers to look at, but you need to identify the most important ones. And hopefully today we've given you some ideas, and I'll fix this. I, I have this done every year, and then what I did, I thought, I'll, I'll update the most recent Morningstar report, and some of my boxes didn't quite fit. I'll make sure we fix those, so when you go to Morning Street, that'll be great. Or they'll do better. Matt, how about you? I just, I like talking um, just about index funds. I think when I look and think about what I'm going to do and what I'm doing right now, it's, it's pretty much all an index fund. It's just because the, the low cost, the low fees, and 
for me, it really helps like the sleep well portfolio because I know I'm in the long term. I don't really worry about the ups and downs. So. You know, and, and when you have a sleep well portfolio, when the market goes down, because it will, you kind of sit there, continue to play with your kids, continue to do well at your work, and you don't have to worry about the portfolio. Any other comments? Let's see, I haven't asked you. Sherry, you'll be the last one, and I'll share some of my, my thoughts. Um, I just like how you've been talking about not needing to actually manage your portfolio. That's probably something I forget. And actually, once you set the, the asset allocation, it's pretty much on autopilot. And once a year, you kind of, when you get toward the end of the year, you kind of make sure you offset your capital gains and your capital losses. You balance through buys and offerings. So let me just share my takeaways. Number one, if you don't know what you're looking for, how will you find it? So you need to make sure that you know what a good mutual fund is. What makes a good mutual fund? The, the ones I put up here are just ideas. There are probably some other ones. So we probably should add. Two, it may seem simple and logical what we are teaching, but there's a ton of thought, research, and theory supporting what we teach. Again, that article by John Bolton. That those who invest in low cost funds will have significantly more. He put 65% more retirement than those who don't. And three, just as in financial formulas, some things are more important than others. Remember, it's the same in life and in finances. And the most important thing is faith in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Thanks, everyone.